in as much as we can figure out the uh, meaning of these rituals without delving too much in the psychology of it, um, Garrett was definitely pointing out to the possibility that the rituals, however, uh, uh, however involved they might be, are also the mechanism that is helping to reproduce the systems and essentially, at the very least, they help people get involved into the uh, spiritual life. So he said, however, though any ritual, religious ritual, no matter how apparently automatic or conventional, if it is truly automatic or merely conventional, it is not religious, involves this fu symbolic fusion of ethos and worldview, it is mainly certain more more elaborate and usually more public ones, ones in which a broad range of moods and motivations on the one hand and a metaphysical conception on the other are caught up, which shape the spiritual consciousness of a people. So obviously, um, if a ritual is completely automatic, that is, people do not know what they are doing, it is very hard to consider that religious. If people are doing it without uh, knowing the religious content in it, it is not religious, but more importantly, because it is this connection of uh, the spiritual and uh, the material, it is the spiritual of the sacred and the profane, there's a connection of ethos, ethics, and worldview. The, uh, the best uh, um, advantage that any ritual can have is that it can be perceived and especially seen from the outside. And this is especially relevant in the context of uh, syncretism, because uh, certainly those uh, rituals were visible to the people uh, who were colonized by Europeans, but they were not necessarily explained as such. And so therefore, people could see the ritual part, but they could not understand the religious part. However, they already had their own religion, so the religious part was uh, the one that they already had. And the uh, spiritual part was the one they, they had access to, and the material physical part they could see. And uh, the the example that is uh, given in uh, in uh, some uh, in 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 many terms would be the uh, the Virgin Mary as it appears throughout Mexico, uh, uh, represented as a uh, uh, la Virgen de Guadalupe, so the the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, based on the uh, um, a uh, an indigenous uh, um, an, an indigenous uh, uh, farm worker seeing or according to himself anyway uh, seeing the the Virgin Mary in in the field and uh, she became connected to uh, so on the left you have the our traditional Virgin Mary on the middle you have a uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe on the right you have a uh, pre-Hispanic Aztec goddess named Tonantzin who uh, is typically represented as uh, as uh, having uh, children, as bearing children, as uh, the kind of the the mother creator, if you will. So, uh, uh, whether this person had seen their own religious apparition, whether they had seen the Virgin Mary or a combination of the two, the representation that comes after that from the cult of uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe is this one right here, of a uh, Mother Earth, a, uh, a goddess of, uh, of sustenance of, uh, of the ancestors, a, uh, a person that is kind of a symbol of uh, the field builds, et cetera, and uh, coming into a uh, fully realized form of um, of, uh, of of ritual uh, according to a, an image and a, a product system. And the result of that is that uh, in many places, especially uh, places that have an indigenous heritage in Mexico, you have a syncretic form of Catholicism that has also developed itself. The Altapenal were themselves divided into constituent sub-communities, Galpoli, each with its own leadership and religious center. These in turn were divided into neighborhoods or household. These sub-communities were accustomed to rotating the leadership of the Atapeto. This structure continued to be the basis of parish and government administration in the Spanish. Parish, lay sodality, or cofadrias uh, dedicated to specific patron saints were based on these traditional units. The Nahuas adapted the Spanish concept of saints to their own understanding of local patron gods, often picking a saint who had similar characteristic and whose feast day was near that of their traditional gods. 
So a feast such as a feast uh, dedicated to uh, some kind of a religious ceremony would to turn into a much larger form of uh, of a ritual once other people see the possibility or see number one uh, the Virgin Mary, see number two their own uh, indigenous spirituality, see number three that it is a uh, functional religious system, and also see that there is a um, a benefit to uh, to the ritual. Let's say on, on the feast. Let's say that it brings you uh, strength uh, in a in time of needs. Let's say that it is uh, uh, a a symbol of the, your your indigenous power, a symbol of the earth. Maybe it doesn't matter what the symbol is. It mostly matters that people are uh, latching onto it, and this turns into uh, a much broader um, a much broader practice of. Uh, of, of religion. So the year 1663 saw the beginning of a long campaign by the cathedral chapter of Mexico City to persuade the Vatican to accept the Mexican Virgin of Guadalupe based on the revelation of Mary in Mexico and to give the cult its own feast of December 12th. Until then, the feast of Our Lady Guadalupe had been associated with the general feast of the Nativity of Mary on September 8th. Occasionally, the Hieronymite order that controlled the cult of Mary of Extremadura in Spain sought to claim the alms from the Mexican shrine on the grounds that it was an extension of their own. There had already been a uh, um, there already appeared a 1660 a version of Sanchez's account so that's the person who saw the virgin in, in the field and uh, without biblical exegesis the by the Spanish Jesuit Mateo de la Cruz, he used old church calendars to establish the date on which the miraculous image was revealed to Archbishop Zamoraga as December 12, 1531. So uh, using similarly the their own uh, version of spirituality, which is a science that calculates the calendar based on the, your understanding of biblical events, the broader Catholic Church in Mexico sought to adopt the symbol of the Virgin of Guadalupe as a uh, symbol of, uh, of Catholicism, not so much a symbol of syncretism that, as we said uh, in the last video, is not um, not easily accepted, but rather as a symbol of uh, their own creed. And it's just so happens to be a creed that is happening within a, uh, a geographical setting that is not the one in which it was uh, developed. So uh, more so than uh, the idea of uh, religion, more so than the the process of um, the process of uh, of belief, this this Virgin of Guadalupe becomes a symbol of the connections that are made on that day, including the connections of uh, indigenous folks and the colonizers. And the result is a very wide ranging, very popular uh, uh, holiday in in Mexico, where people get to uh, enjoy their time, uh, their their holiday, and uh, visit the, uh, the the holy spaces. Um, um, you know, uh, as a community outside of their daily life, outside of their uh, their their field product or wherever they are living now, obviously, because we are now a few hundred years down the line and the, the cult has uh, remained, the practice has remained. So uh, 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 the, the ritual is very important, especially in this context, because now it has bridged the divide, not only between a sacred and a profane, but even between a sacred uh, practice of Catholicism, one that is very highly defended, and the profane practice of indigenous, uh, of indigenous religion, which has turned into uh, a, a full-grown religious system. So the fact that um, um, our, our our rituals are are, be, are being practiced in public, so seeing uh, again seeing such a, a a meeting of people and kind of getting caught up in the enthusiasm, it is very important to realize that it is not just important for the ritual to happen internally, but it is also important for bystanders, for anyone who could see this, because. Well, you can only be amazed, you can only be awed by the fact that all of these people are gathering for their worship, and that might be something that's imperational, something that makes you curious, maybe something that would maybe turn your attention to that uh, religion, maybe to that practice or whatever it is. 
Uh, so an example here of uh, people being uh, kind of caught up in such uh, in such a celebration. We stood beside pilgrims in front of an enormous screen that had that that year had been erected by TV Azteca's base at the rear of the plaza. The pilgrims might have seen themselves and other visitors appearing intermittently on the screen or observe the televised mass that was going on inside the basilica. Indeed, many followed the projected liturgy of the Mass as if they were inside the church. Others recorded bits of the Mass on their cell phones. The space of institutional Catholicism effectively had been extended into the popular Mass space of the plaza, enclosing it into a space directed by its own logic, while the reverse would not have been possible. The illusion presented was that the people's direct involvement in and even creation of the event, though within pre-established limits. Now, um, you, you could make a broader argument as to whether it is acceptable to uh, to just uh, welcome anyone into your religious practice or if this is uh, ethical or whatever, but that's beyond the, the context of this particular class where we are uh, looking at myth more generally speaking and especially as the ritual for this week. Here, the ritual is serving this process of, uh, of bridging uh, between people and between their communities. And uh, although it is sometimes associated more directly with the hero and you could make a case that the Virgin of Guadalupe is, is a, a hero for indigenous folks in Mexico. Um, the person who who saw the the apparition of the, of the Virgin Mary is somewhat of a prophet, etc. I mean, it is very easy to project the uh, religious vocabulary into this conversation, but this is especially important to think of it as a, as a uh, as a performance of your own life of your ethics and of course as something that will uh, possibly influence your 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 worldview so going back to Garrett's and uh, kind of bridging into the video that I'm posting uh, tomorrow there is the 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 Jap Japanese practice that represents this this very intricate almost theatrical position now this is a ritual that is uh, easily confused with theater as a result of that, as opposed to uh, the 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 uh, the rituals of Catholicism, which most people would not confuse. Uh, but but it is important to, to see that this is very much part of the process. And just because they are coded in a certain way, coded as ritual, coded as religious, coded as theater, uh, doesn't make the, those spectacles any more interesting, any more important, and any more uh, functional for, uh, for the daily lives of individuals. The fascination. So this is from the article reading for this week. The fascination which the the figure of the witch holds for the Balinese imagination can only be explained when it is recognized that the witch is not only a fear-inspiring figure, but that she is fear. Her hands, with their long, menacing fingernails, do not clutch and claw at their victims, although children who play at being witches do curl their hands in such gestures. But the witch herself spread her arms with palms out and her finger flexed backward in the gesture the Balinese call kapar a term which they apply to the sudden startled reaction of a man who falls from a tree. Only when we see the witch as herself afraid as well as frightening is it, it is possible to explain her appeal and the pathos which surrounds her as she dances, hairy, forbidding, tusked and alone, giving her occasional high eerie laugh. So this is helping us make sense of those things that are much bigger, even the existence of the gods themselves. Now, I'd said at the beginning that we were not diving too much into the the psychology of it, but it is worth noting that there is obviously a pretty big role of psychology to be played here, and uh, Sigmund Freud himself was very interested in ritual for that process. Now, he makes that connection especially for uh, what uh, he called at the time neurotic uh, ceremonials or uh, neurotic uh, rituals, if you will, kind of obsessive actions uh, or or what today would be called tics uh, for, for many people. But um, uh, Freud was not a friend of religion as a whole. He did not believe that God existed. And uh, so any kind of religious explanation for ritual was was wrong, according to him. His idea was that the uh, rituals are very important in repeating those senses and especially the what he sees as the uh, first, the beginning of humanity, which is not the creation from Adam, but uh, the murders that happen, uh, Cain and Abel and also... Uh, uh, well, mostly Cain and Abel and every other uh, ritual murder that happens in the, in the Bible. 
Um, so, so, so to him, the the repetition of anything. So, uh, it's probably worth noticing. So, obviously, the 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 ritual of uh, of uh, Cain and Abel is related to uh, uh, jealousy over the role of the father or the mother. I mean, with even the most basic understanding of of Freud, you probably know this uh, this association between Freud and uh, and the relationship to the parents. And obviously, this is what. Um, uh, this is what this uh, this uh, situation is, is described as here. So, so Freud seeing that everything is has something to do with your your parents and your relationship, uh, uh, the 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 ritual of killing and the ritual of getting over the the consequences of that murder is is especially important. But it is also a way for uh, those humans who have uh, who have committed the, the worst crime to be able to make sense of their role on Earth, away from the father, away from the mother. So it is easy to see where the resemblances lie between neurotic ceremonials and the sacred acts of religious ritual. In the qualms of conscience brought on by their neglect and their complete isolation from other uh, actions uh, shown in the prohibition against interruption. So again, right, uh, you don't stop halfway through your meal or you're not interrupted by uh, a phone or whatever. I talked about that a few days ago. In the conscientiousness with which they are carried Read out in every detail, but the differences are equally obvious, and a few of them are so glaring that they make the comparison a sacrilege. The greater individual variability of neurotic ceremonial actions, in contrast to the stereotype character of rituals, prayer, turning to the east, etc., their private nature as opposed to the public and communal characters of religious observances above all. However, the fact that while the minutia of religious ceremonial have full of significance and have a symbolic meaning, those of neurotics seem foolish and senseless. So, of course, he's uh, he's uh, connecting, he's doing uh, exactly what we have been talking about so far in this class. He's repeating a lot of his own themes and he's connecting the realm of the sacred, which he he does not believe in with the realm of the profane, which he sees everywhere. So he is doing that same role of, uh, of fulfilling his own ritual for his own science in a way.